I've been a science communicator about physics for long enough to have observed a template. Allow me to share an instance with you from my initial days um, that I remember very vaguely though. Uh, I was speaking on Aristotelian physics, how wrong it was, and I might have said something like uh, Aristotle died not in peace, given that his, his physics couldn't explain uh, the retrograde motion of planets. And uh, I was amazed to see the faces of my audience. They were, they were now suddenly interested. Um, and, and, and my takeaway was that if you want to convey something, which is by the way the template, uh, you, you, you make it more romantic, more relatable in some sense. And um, what this template did to my practice was to make me include various instances from the history of physics. And what it did to me personally was that I was gradually more and more interested, uh, not in the objective physics, but the subjective roots that lead to the governance of the physics community. On that note, I would like to make this talk about, again, the instances from the history of physics uh, in the form of letters that would uh, illustrate how physics community uh, composes of people that are not very different from us after all. Um, they live uh, the same lives and, and uh, behind the symbols and equations they feel the same kinds of feelings we do. All right, we'll go in chronology. The first discourse that I have to share is the correspondence between Albert Einstein and Ernst Mach. Uh, just to remind, Albert Einstein was the physicist who in early 20th century demolished the Newtonian physics by demolishing the concept of absolute time. Be assured, we'll not get into physics here. Mach, on the other hand, is again a physicist, a generation senior to Einstein. Einstein considers him to be the leading physicist of his era upon reading his book The Science of Mechanics, where Mack writes against the Newtonian physics. Einstein confesses in a letter to his friend, who introduced him to Mack's book, that the book proved highly influential uh, in his seminal work. So what do we have as of now? We have a duo of uh, a student and a teacher, Einstein and Mack. Einstein appreciates Mac so much so that, uh, check out this letter, he just goes on fanboying. He says, I'm very glad that you're pleased with the relativity theory. Thank you again for your friendly letter. I remain your student. He then mentions Planck, Max Planck, who had been his close friend. He says, I can't quite understand how Planck has so little understanding for your efforts. Do you see the degree of informality? He's not at all diplomatic over here. Uh, which is which is what showcases that what he has to write about Mac uh, in this letter is 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 really what he feels about Mac. Everything seems smooth so far. They correspond further. Mac passes away in 1916, and five years later, in 1921, uh, his last book, uh, The Principles of Physical Optics, gets published. Now, in the preface of it, uh, Mac writes, which is what he wrote in 1913. Uh, the following. I gather from the publications which have reached me, and especially from my correspondence, that I am gradually becoming regarded as the forerunner of relativity. Skipping a few lines, I must however as assuredly disclaim to be a forerunner of the relativists, as I personally reject the atomistic doctrine of the present-day school or church, the reason why and the extent to which I reject the present-day relativity theory. Well, that's sad, don't you think? What happened is that there was a student, there was a teacher. The student was in awe of the teacher. He got inspired by his teacher's work uh, such that he produced something that would go on to be uh, claimed as the single most elegant piece of work in physics, only to realize later that his teacher didn't think so, while their correspondence suggested otherwise. Um, this brings me to uh, draw your attention to the title of the part, Strung. One angle could be that Einstein was imprinted with Mach's philosophy of doing physics, and the other angle could be that he was left with Mach's dissettlement or rejection of uh, his relativity theory for the rest of his life, as Mach was no longer available for any correspondence. Uh, this reminds me uh, of a clip from uh, Elon Musk's interview. Check it out. Neil Armstrong, Gene Cernan have both testified against commercial spaceflight in the way that you're developing it, and I wonder what you think of that. 
I was very sad to see that uh, because those guys are, yeah, you know, th those guys are heroes of mine, so it's really tough. I will now discuss Feynman's, Richard P. Feynman's letter to his first wife, Arlene. Feynman is perhaps considered the most celebrated theoretical physicist after Albert Einstein in the pop culture for his lecture series on gravitation and uh, videos on how to do science on YouTube. Now, since I've mentioned first uh, before wife, uh, you might think that there was a second uh, and, and correspondingly uh, the, the first one didn't work out. Well, well, that's that's partly true. There was a second for sure, but uh, there was a second because uh, his first wife Arlene she passed away now the letter that I'm going to discuss that I'm going to present uh, Was written by Feynman to Arlene two years after her death This is dated October 17th 1946 Dear Arlene, I adore you sweetheart. I know how much you like to hear that, but I don't only write it because you like it, I write it because it makes me warm all over inside to write it to you. It is such a terribly long time since I last wrote to you, almost two years, but I know you'll excuse me because you understand how I am, stubborn and realistic, and I thought that there was no sense to writing. But now I know my darling wife that it is right to do what I have delayed in doing and that I have done so much in the past. I want to tell you I love you. I want to love you. I will always love you. Well, I think I misread that. It's all fine as long as it's love. Skipping a few lines and he goes on to write, I know you will assure me that I'm foolish and that you want me to have full happiness and don't want to be in my way. I'll bet that you're surprised that I don't even have a girlfriend except you, my sweetheart, after two years. But you can't help it, darling, nor can I. I don't understand it, for I have met many girls and very nice ones, and I don't want to remain alone, but in two or three meetings, they all seem ashes. You only are left to me. You are real. My darling wife, I do adore you. I love my wife. My wife is dead. Then he goes on to mention something very sarcastically. P.S. Please excuse my not mailing this, but I don't know your new address. Well, I think I did a pretty good job. Uh, merely reading the letter illustrates how romantic he was, physicists have been and can be. The reason that would have uh, led uh, him to write this letter at that moment, I suspect, is that he would have been feeling low because of his involvement with uh, the Manhattan Project, the uh, Japan bombing in World War II that dispersed thousands of lives in, in a second. Uh, which brings me to the next letter. What I have for you in this part is not a letter per se, it's a report. So what happened after the World War II in the United States is that the General Advisory Committee was formed uh, and its task was to report to the Atomic Energy Commission about the plausibility of the hydrogen bomb, uh, which would be some hundred to thousand times more impactful and devastating than the bombs dropped on uh, Japan in the World War II. This committee comprised of physicists from the Manhattan Project who had already worked in the World War II um, and they issued a report on 30th October 1949 and it was signed by many physicists including Robert J. Oppenheimer who was the director of the Manhattan Project. Now something remarkable about the report is that while parts of it are dedicated to the technical points concerning the development of the bomb, a lot of it basically says in short, we do not endorse the making of it. Uh, there must be on ethical grounds a limit to physics applications in weaponry that the US could demonstrate and be an example by not making the bomb. Now note that this is coming from physicists who were involved, if not directly, they were definitely contributors in the killings of uh, thousands of people in the past. But something happened, something, sense of uh, humanity uh, was inflicted within their minds uh, by the bombing, it seems. 
Now, I, I can just read the report, but since I've managed to have the script of Oppenheimer's hearing from soon after when the General Advisory Committee issued the report, 30th October 1949, I will read from this one. Since Oppenheimer reads the report in the House, the report is inclusive anyway. Now note that this document is declassified. I'm not violating national security in my consciousness. Oppenheimer says, it is clear that the use of this weapon would bring about the destruction of innumerable human lives. Senator then says, are you reading from the advisory committee report, thinking that Oppenheimer would be uh, presenting very colloquially his opinion? Oppenheimer then says, yes, sir, I am. It is not mine, I assure you. He presents very clearly what he calls the guts of the thing in the following paragraph. He says, although the members of the advisory committee are not unanimous in their proposals as to what should be done with regard to the super bomb, there are certain elements of unanimity among us. We all hope that by some means or another, the development of these weapons can be avoided. We are all reluctant to see the United States take the initiative in precipitating this development. We are all agreed that it would be wrong at the present moment to commit ourselves to an all-out effort towards its development. That is the guts of the thing. He then reads the part of the report written by Enrico Fermi and Isaac Rabi, the two associated Nobel laureates. Necessarily, such a weapon goes far beyond any military objective and enters the range of very great natural catastrophes. By its very nature, it cannot be confined to a military objective but becomes a weapon which in practical effect is almost one of genocide. It is clear that the use of such a weapon cannot be justified on any ethical grounds which gives a human being a certain individuality and dignity even if he happens to be a resident of an enemy country. Well, this report truly indicates that physicists aren't machines. What happened later after the report, as is inscribed in the chapters of history, is that the report wasn't taken seriously. Uh, the first hydrogen bomb, codenamed Mike, was tested in 1952, only two years later. About Oppenheimer, he was abandoned, disowned, he was kept off the radar of media to ensure that he doesn't publicly say the god he was of the war that he is against the development of the hydrogen bombs while the U.S. continues producing them. We knew the world would not be the same. Few people laughed. Few people cried. Most people were silent. I remembered the line from the Hindu scripture, the Bhagavad Gita, Vishnu is trying to persuade the prince that he should do his duty and to impress him takes on his multi-armed form and says, now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. I suppose we all thought that one way or another. In the previous part, we discussed the human quality. The other quality that was evident was that of unity. You see how people came together to collectively make a unanimous comment? I will make this section exclusively about illustrating this quality. In 2017, there was an article published, namely, Pop Goes the Universe in Scientific American. The three authors, Anna Ijaz, Paul J. Steinhardt, and Abraham Loeb, criticized the theory of cosmic inflation that essentially explains the bang of the Big Bang. As the name suggests, it says that our universe, which was once very small in the past, expanded very rapidly to create the elements that composed the present. Inflation was first proposed in 1980 by Alan H. Gould, who was fortunately one of my professors at MIT, to fix the problems of the conventional Big Bang Theory. So certainly when Guth and other inflation admirers read the article, they were pissed off, they were angry. They came together to write a reply. There were 33 of them who signed the reply, including a lot of Nobel laureates. All of them, all of them composed the set of physicists that literally kept 
our understanding of the cosmos at its frontiers. They say, according to the High Energy Physics Database Inspire, there are now more than 14,000 papers in the scientific literature written by over 9,000 distinct scientists that use the word inflation or inflationary in their titles or abstracts. By claiming that inflationary cosmology lies outside the scientific method, the authors are dismissing the research of not only the authors of this letter, but also that of a substantial contingent of the scientific community. They then defend inflation on scientific grounds. What I find noteworthy to read next is the following. Like any scientific theory, inflation need not address all conceivable questions. Inflationary models, like all scientific theories, rest on a set of assumptions. And to understand those assumptions, we might need to appeal to some deeper theory. This, however, does not undermine the success of inflationary models. Skipping a few lines, during the more than 35 years of its existence, inflationary theory has gradually become the main cosmological paradigm describing the early stages of the evolution of the universe and the formulation of its large-scale structure. No one claims that inflation has become certain. Scientific theories don't get proved the way mathematical theorems do. But as time passes, the successful ones become better and better, established by improved experimental tests and theoretical advances. And this has happened with inflation. Progress continues, supported by enthusiastic efforts of many scientists who have chosen to participate in this vibrant branch of cosmology. Empirical science is alive and well. Exclamation. So you see what they did here. They're not defending inflation against any empirical data. In fact, they'd be the first ones to reject inflation if proper experiments suggest otherwise, given the brilliant scientists they are. I've known a couple of them personally. All what they are saying is that inflation passes every test to qualify as a scientific theory, and you dare not challenge that. All right, we are in my final words. What have we learned so far from letters, reports, instances from the history of physics? Well, we have that just like any other group, the physics community shares the same diverse subjective sophistication. And isn't it amazing to realize that someone who decrypts the universe shares the same values, the same behaviors, and it's only something that makes the difference. On that note, I would like to end by quoting my dear friend Srishti Desai. She says, if you want to understand something, try understanding it's someone.